Okay, so there we go. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sophia Nahawi, author event coordinator here at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Thank you for joining us for this evening's Writer's Life program with Mecca Jamila Sullivan, joined in conversation by fellow novelist Joan Yun. Mecca Jamila Sullivan is the author of two prior books, which includes the short story collection, Blue Talk and Love, winner of the 2018 Judith Markowitz Award for Emerging LGBTQ Writers. She is an English professor at Georgetown University. Tonight, she joins us to discuss her debut novel, Big Girl, which tells the story of Malaya, an eight-year-old struggling under the expectations of her family and white Upper East Side prep school in the early 1990s. As she wrestles with the inherited stigmas surrounding her body, a family tragedy brings the source of Malaya's hunger to the forefront and asks her how to best embrace her desires for her future. Kirkus Review says, a, law, a young girl learns and redefines what it means to take up space. Sullivan writes with tenderness and uses the language of poetry to communicate her protagonist's inner life, a lyrical and important coming of age novel. In Clavis Natara's review in the New York Times book review, she says, Big Girl triumphs as a love letter to the black girls who are forced to enter womanhood too early and to a version of Harlem that no longer exists. In this novel, gentrification means a violent thinning of the true beauty of black and immigrant cultures and tight-knit communities that have been nearly erased in service of commercialism and whiteness. Joining Mecca in conversation is Jung Young. Jung is the author of the novels, Oh Beautiful and Shelter. Her writing has appeared in many publications, including the Washington Post, The Atlantic, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. She is an English professor at George Washington University and resides right here in Baltimore. And now, without further ado, please welcome Mecca Jamila Sullivan and Jung Young to the stage. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, you all can hear me, right? So, hi. Hi. Good, good, good morning. Good Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> hi, everyone. Thank you so much and welcome to Baltimore. We're really excited Thank to have you. you. Thank you, John. It's very, very cool to be here. It's a, you know, it's a city I always love visiting and this is my first reading in Baltimore in many years. So I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Well, thank you all for being here as well. And for people who are, who are signed in virtually, we're so happy to have you. I think you wanted to start with a little bit of a reading from Big Girl, right? Yeah, I thought I would. I all thought right. I'd just kind of, you know, read. I'm just gonna read the very first section. So there isn't much, you know, kind of setup or intro needed, but you know, Big Girl, essentially, I think of it as a novel about Black women, women in general, queer people, um, and the kind of paths we take often across generations to make space for ourselves in the world. And so the novel follows a character named Malaya Clondon from the time she's a big Black eight-year-old girl to the time she's a very big Black teenager. And it sort of charts her process of coming to figure out how to define herself um, and make space for herself against the backdrop of a kind of rapidly changing Harlem, New York. So this scene is the very first scene, um, and Malaya is eight years old, and it's, now it's the late 1980s. The truth was, Malaya Clondon had been thinking of French fries since last night. She craved them as she ate Chinese food in secret with her father while her mother worked late at the university. The thought of French fries stayed with the eight-year-old through the canned laughter and blonde-headed family tableaus of the Friday night sitcom lineup each week and helped her push herself from the bed the next morning. She thought of the shiny fried strips nestled together, boasting countless shades of yellow and gold from the time she cleared the front steps, the front steps of the family's brownstone at 8 a.m. each Saturday until she felt at last the film of hot grease on her face after African dance class so much later in the day. On the walk to the meeting on Frederick Douglass Boulevard, other foods did drift to mind. Malaya and her mother, Naila, passed at least eight bodegas, plus the McDonald's, the Kentucky Fried, and the Woolworths on Broadway, where the smell of hot popcorn seeped out in slow waves from beneath the glass doors. On 145th Street, there was Copeland's Restaurant and Reliable Cafeteria, where they made crispy smothered chicken with gravy as thick as pudding and potato salad that was perfectly sweet and salty at once. 
But by the time the Quandon women pushed through the heavy green doors of the AME Mount Canaan Church and went down to the basement community center, by the time Malaya took her turn on the scale and watched red numbers blink and multiply beneath her, feeling Naila's eyes fixed on the number panel from behind, Malaya thought only of the potato and ketchup crunch crusted mush that she would have later. She did not think of the hour of dance class she would have to get through beforehand or what lies she would tell as to how her allowance had been spent. Well, don't everybody speak up at once now. Miss Adelaide, the meeting leader, laughed over the collar of her lavender suit. Malaya sat in a sea of fat women on folding chairs and watched Miss Adelaide walk to the front. Miss Adelaide caressed the plastic easel, flipping back a page marked Emotional Triggers Pie Chart and exposing a sheet as clean and white as the face of a new tub of Cool Whip. She stood there, her hip sloped prettily out before her, arms loose and easy along her waist. Come on, ladies, don't be shy. Miss Adelaide shifted into another breathtakingly casual pose, resting her weight on one tall, plum-colored high heel and letting a hand float up to stroke the paper. I want you to think about your favorite food. You know we all have that one food that always gets us in trouble. I want you to think about it. Call it out. Malaya listened, catching a few coughs, small squeakings of the metal seats. The rustling of a paper bag somewhere in the back of the room brought salt water to Malaya's mouth as she thought of removing the fries from their paper bag. She imagined the strips bending over one another in their red and white striped dish, salt crystals hitting them from all sides and sparkling like glitter. All right now, I know it can be embarrassing. Miss Adelaide leaned back, posed, then moved slowly toward Malaya and Naila, who sat a seat away from each other to leave room for both their hips, Naila always said. Malaya thought nothing of Miss Adelaide's first few steps, except how nice it was the way the tapping of the woman's heels seemed to punctuate the soft rub of her shimmery pantyhose. Zhut, zhut. But within seconds, Malaya could smell Miss Adelaide's perfume in her face and found herself staring directly at the silver buckle on her purple suede belt. Fear frothed up in Malaya's chest as the synthetic cherry stink of Miss Adelaide's uncapped marker prickled the insides of her nostrils. She would lie, she decided. She would disclose a passion for yogurt, welcome and unusual in a girl of eight. Her face puffed with earnestness. She would tell the woman that she was centered, committed, and in control, that she'd take fat-free frozen yogurt over cookie dough ice cream any day. She would make her mother proud and make this lean purple creature go back and check her scale. Those red numbers could not be right. This girl could not weigh 168 pounds, committed as she was. It was Malaya's specialty, this kind of invention. It was how she helped other children pronounce her name. Malaya, like I don't tell the truth. She parted her lips, prepared to declare her fidelity to the program. Miss Adelaide's mouth was plump, and her red lipstick looked like jelly sliding over her lip line into her deep brown skin. She tugged at the empty chair between Malaya and Naila, gently easing it from between them. I'm sorry, baby, she cooed. Did you want to say something? Malaya's mouth went dry and mealy. She paused, wondering if her lies were worth telling, now that it was clear she wasn't being asked to give up anything more than an empty chair. She shook her head no. Well, everyone is so shy this morning. Miss Adelaide pushed the chair to the center of the room and glided into it like a goose into a familiar pond. So I'll tell you all first. Mine was corn with butter. Anytime there was corn around, I knew I would not be able to control myself. I used to be a corn junkie. A few ladies along the wall chuckled. And I don't mean just a little pat, she continued. I'm talking about butter, okay? At this, Miss Adelaide changed shape before Malaya's eyes. She uncrossed her legs, hunched over, filled her cheeks with air, and made smacking noises as she ran her fingers back and forth in front of her mouth, mimicking a wet and unsightly battle with an ear of corn, of corn on the cob. The room roared. Fat ladies shifted massive thighs in their chairs. Thick ladies clapped their hands and crashed against each other like waves. And let me tell you something, Miss Adelaide said, leaning forward and pointing a finger at the group in a gesture, a gesture of sister girl confidence. I know I'm not the only one. The whole room laughed again, and one woman leaned her head back and opened her mouth so wide, Malaya thought she might freeze in that pose, turn to stone, and begin to spout water like a fish in a fountain. Then Miss Adelaide returned to herself just like that, left leg draped over right, shoulders straight, manicured hands with their red-tipped nails left resting coolly on her lap.
Well, another woman said from the fourth or fifth row, I do have a weakness for pasta. I heard that, someone shouted, what kind? And they were off talking about food. Malaya tried not to listen, except when Naila murmured in testimony when the women mentioned food she herself liked, like pistachio ice cream or oxtails. As food names began to appear on their easel, Malaya imagined each food rising from a plate before the woman who claimed it as her trigger. Squares of lasagna and tall styrofoam cupped milkshakes with cartoon eyes and gloved hands cuffed these women to their chairs in Malaya's imagination, dancing and singing devilishly as they leapt down their throats. The women, helpless victims, dragged themselves sadly to these meetings each week as their only hope. Quietly, in Malaya's mind, she, continued, she considered what this trigger might be for her, but each food she thought of suddenly lost its appeal among these women who seemed to feel guilty for putting too much gravy on their grits. She thought of the dulce de coco candy she ate on the school bus with her friend Shanice Guzman, uh, that, and the chocolate chip cookies as big as her face that she brought every day with money stolen from her mother's coat pocket. These foods seemed unspeakable among the meeting women. Even imagining them stung her with guilt. Malaya planned to eat her fries and enjoy them as soon as she could leave these women's sight. She would not ruin that moment by thinking of it now. My daughter and I like pie. Naila's hand fell into her lap once the sentence was out. Malaya felt a force field of eyes on her. I don't keep anything like that in the house, of course, Naila continued. And when we go out, I try not to order dessert. But sometimes on the weekends, I'll order an apple pie. Malaya anticipated the fancy syllable she knew would come next, a la mode. I try not to eat the filling, her mother went on, shifting her weight and pulling her African mud cloth jacket around her shoulders. My favorite part is the crust. My daughter likes the filling, so if I do have a craving, rather than deprive her myself, you know, I always suggest we share. The room emitted a wave of supportive mm-hmms, but you know children, they want their own. I don't usually let her order anything, but once we've eaten that pie, we're out of control. We're off program for the rest of the weekend, sometimes the whole week. Miss Adelaide added pie to the list, which had grown to cover the entire page, leaving only a tiny diagonal of space between salmon chips, I mean salmon cakes and platano chips for the three, the three letters of the clonded women's apparent trigger. Malaya wished to liquefy and slide from her seat, find herself gone from the basement into that word pie, curled into the lower nook of the E as though it were a shaded ground below an apple tree. She wished for spots of sun to heat her sandaled feet as the leaves of her E tree rustled, and for the cool of an afternoon to raise goosebumps along her legs. In truth, Malaya was not so compelled by pie. She would eat the filling because it was there and because it was the only chance she'd have all week to indulge herself in plain view right next to her mother. And besides, Malaya knew, Naila would feel better if she herself ate only the crust. What her mother did not know, what could not be written on Miss Adelaide's board for lack of space and limitations of language, was that Malaya would have preferred an endless plate of potatoes over pie without question. Mashed, salted, swaddled in gravy or butter or both, and served in a bottomless mixing bowl, that was how Malaya wanted to eat. She rarely had the chance, even when her father and mother weren't there to watch her, Giselle, the babysitter, usually was. But by now, Malaya had noticed in herself a tendency to choose quantity over quality, pools and pools of potatoes over a shared slice of fancy pie. She had not yet learned words like abundance or profusion or glut. The only word she could find to describe her true trigger was more. Of all the women in the room, 30 at least, only two seemed to share her passion. The loud woman who had broken the silence what now seemed like ages ago, and a smaller woman in the corner who raised a hand only inches above her shoulder and said, almost in a whisper, I have trouble with plain white rice. Thank you. Thank you. I love that as an opening for this novel so much mm -hmm. because I think you captured like the real discomfort of, as someone who's been to a Weight sure. Watchers meeting, who right. knows like those those questions that they throw out. Right. Um, I, I think that's such a great beginning. So being overweight is something that Mal Malaya shares in common with her mother, mm -hmm. um, with her grandmother, and to a certain extent, her great grandmother. And I think, you know, passed down in these generations of women are a lot of ideas and attitudes about mm -hmm. weight and womanhood, black, particularly black womanhood. Absolutely. So I'm wondering if you can start us off by talking a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. So absolutely right. You know, the kind of 
confrontation with one's weight and one's body, this is definitely something that Malaya is experiencing as she starts to come of age. And she comes to realize that this is actually something that her mother has experienced, her grandmother. And you mentioned, right, even, you know, as she gets older, she starts to notice that this is a family legacy that sort of, you know, it, she, she questions how far back, how many generations back it goes. And even the notion of sort of overweight, right, that kind of the question is sort of who sets the standard for what a body exactly. should be, right? This is exactly what Malaya is coming to confront herself. And like most of our kind of coming of age processes, often that happens in conversation with what we learn from our family, mm -hmm. right? And so this is absolutely what Malaya, this is the kind of journey that, that Malaya is on. And I, you know, I appreciate that. I enjoyed writing that scene and I, I love hearing that it resonates with folks, right? Because <laughs> yeah, it's, it is super uncomfortable. In some ways these, you know, those kinds of of settings ask us to have deep kind of conversations about, you know, potentially painful or very sort of tender aspects of our lives and to do it in this sort of, you know, public way, right? The, almost a kind of like confessional as though if we just sort of talk about it in this public way and share in a sense of shame, mm -hmm. that'll change our behavior and somehow that'll change our bodies, right? Even as we know, you know, that doesn't tend to work long term. Yeah. And so for Malaya, as an eight year old, she's so young that in some ways she can kind of like look at this and say, this, this doesn't really make sense. I'd rather just like fantasize about my French fries. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I'm not going to ruin that by sitting and indulging in this feeling of shame that seems to be the the main kind of vibe in this space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she's getting it so early mm -hmm. and so young and she's already sort of aware of the ways in which like something is wrong. Yeah. Something is like these feelings of being wrong are kind of being imposed on her. Yeah. And she's smart and aware and it's sort of prickling up in interesting ways. Yeah, exactly. And I, it was a lot of fun for me to kind of inhabit her perspective there because in some ways she's so young that she doesn't even, she's not even questioning her rejection of mm -hmm. this logic, right? She's like, I don't even want to, I'm not, I'm going to check out, right? Like, I don't even want to be part of this conversation. I'm going to have my fantasy life about cartoon milkshakes, right? And like, this is what I'm going to be thinking about because, you know, if I spend, if I emotionally invest too much in this space, it doesn't feel safe to me, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, as a writer, it was a lot of fun to kind of like, you know, enjoy that retreat from the shame that we often carry around our bodies and to think about how a child really, you know, automatically because she's already so involved in her own fantasy life and her imagination, she's gotten out at least at this stage in her life. And of course, as she gets older, that becomes more and more difficult, right? To just like fully escape some of those narratives. Um, this is such a character driven novel. Mm -hmm. I, I love Malaya so much. I just, I, I from the very, very int first introduction, I just really, I cared for her and I cared about the things that were being said to her. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you do this really wonderful job with your characters who who love Malaya and yeah. want what's best for her, yeah. but they say some stuff that is so cutting. I, the grandmother in mm -hmm. particular says some of the harshest right. things out of this misguided sense mm -hmm. of love. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about like, <laughs> yeah, 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 about about grandma in particular. <laughs> yeah, okay, I love it. Yeah, so um, her, so the grandmother. This is Malaya's maternal grandmother, right? So her mother's mother. And so in this scene that I just shared, we meet her mother, and you know, a big part of Malaya's sort of path to adulthood, to womanhood, is coming to understand her mother, and it's sort of a, a kind of quest that she's on from an early age, like trying to figure out what makes her mother work what makes her mother who she is. And eventually she comes to kind of think about her grandmother, the woman who raised her mother, right? And sort of thinking about how that impacts her mother and the way that she has raised her. You know, and the grandmother is called Ma Mare. Uh, and Ma Mare is, you know, she's a she sees herself as a kind of like sharpshooter, tell it like it is kind of figure. And in some ways she is, of course, she is very clear on her perspective on the world. And so her perspective on, and she's got these sort of like elaborate philosophies about what, you know, people should and should not do. Possibly relatable content for some folks, right? You know, folks, you know, I, I certainly can recognize figures that I grew up with, right? That sort of had a clear sense of like what a woman should be, what a man should be, what a child should do and shouldn't do. And all of these things sort of rub Malaya the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And yet, Ma Mare also has a way with words, right? She's got all of these sort of sayings that Malaya finds really kind of fascinating. And she's very curious about it. And so that curiosity leads her to come to try to understand Ma Mare better. And so your point about 
love being a motivator of, you know, many of the, the adult sort of approaches to Malaya and to her body. It's true, Malaya comes to realize that Mom Air is doing the best she can. She's trying to protect Malaya. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she thinks that sort of adhering to a very narrow and specific idea of womanhood is the best way to prepare her to succeed in life, right? And to kind of do well in the world. Um, and so, you know, through sort of being fascinated by and just like interested in these wacky, wild, weird things that Mom Air says, Malaya comes to, to understand and have compassion for Ma Mare, mostly so that she can actually have compassion for herself, right? And give herself a compassion that neither her grandmother nor her mother is really able to access for themselves. She was such a beautifully drawn character. I mean, oh, I, she, she had some of the funniest lines, she but like when she funny. entered the room, I got like tight and nervous. Yeah. yeah. Um, because she can do that to a person. Yeah. Um, I mean, and don't you like, isn't that sort of how humor works often, yeah. right? Like, you know, sometimes things are funny because they're true. Yeah. Sometimes things are so true that you kind of have to laugh. Some, And, you know, sometimes I think, you know, sort of the, the delivery, right? And I think especially with, you know, Black communities and communities of color, humor becomes a survival mechanism. And this is absolutely what's going on for Ma Mare, right? She turns things into riddles and into jokes. And, you know, there's a there's an immense well of pain sort of beneath these, you know, sort of ridiculous, wild pronouncements that she makes, right? And so, like, she was a lot of fun to write for that reason. I can imagine. You know, yeah. I, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Ma Mare and, and Naila have this concept of ladiness mm -hmm. that, that, uh, Malaya is is observant of, and she spends a lot of time like watching the way that that these two women interact with yeah. each other, how they talk about other women around them, and she also spends time observing other other women. Mm -hmm. um, there's a character named Ethan Winborn mm -hmm. who comes into the novel in in part two, and she's important. Yeah, um, I I hope that you could talk a little bit yeah. about why she's so interesting. Um, to Malaya and yeah. what she's looking at her for. This is great. Oh, I love this question. Yeah, so absolutely, you know, um, one of the kind of recurring themes is Malaya's confrontations with doctors, right? And with kind of medical settings. Uh, and, you know, in fact, very shortly after the scene that I've just read, we see Malaya at a doctor's appointment. You know, she is, this is the first time the, the term morbidly obese is used to describe her, right? And it really sort of sticks with her. She's trying to, again, figure out how to define herself. So often this comes to, to bear on her understandings of just the words, right? Like you said, all the things that people say to her and about her. And so this phrase morbidly obese really sort of stays with her. Um, and there are a few moments throughout that we see her in these medical settings, dealing with medical doctors, um, and basically what amounts to medical racism, medical fat phobia, right? And all of these things that we know become barriers to care for oppressed communities, for underrepresented communities and underserviced communities of which Malaya is one, right? And yet Ethan Winborn in some ways represents a kind of different relationship to you know, the world of doctors and to care specifically, mm -hmm. right? Like Ethan, because Ethan Winborn, so Malaya's mother, Naila, is a psychologist and um, Ethan Winborn is also a psychologist. They are sort of professional uh, acquaintances, like maybe a little low-key frenemies, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, you know, they, they have a little bit of a kind of rivalry or antipathy that Malaya picks up on early on. So even as a kid, she's like, something about this woman is interesting to me, if only because I know that like she and my mom aren't quite on the same page about things. And she ends up having an opportunity to meet Ethan Winborn. And, um, you know, she becomes just fascinated with her because she is a big woman. She wears bright colors. She travels a lot. And so she represents a completely different vision of womanhood or ladiness, as Malaya thinks of it, right? Like, she represents a different way to be a woman, and she represents a different kind of doctor and a different possibility for a real kind of care that takes into account not only Malaya's body, but also her mind her inner world, right? She sort of respects and listens to Malaya in a way that none of the other doctors that she encounters over the course of the novel do, not only with her, but also her mother, who is a psychologist, right? So she is a doctor, she's Professor Clondon, and yet even her colleagues don't respect her, right? And so Malaya has sort of seen uh, this kind of, you know, um, sort of very limited kind of biased vision of, of women of color, of fat people from doctors. And so Ethan Winborn represents, again, a new possibility 
for being cared for by somebody who, you know, is a, is a professional and professionally trained. That scene where they go to the doctor's office to talk about um, the gastric bypass mm -hmm. surgery is a really interesting one. Mm -hmm. And it sounds strange. Uh, if you haven't read the book, when you do read the book, you'll understand why, why I'm saying this. I felt so proud and so happy for mm -hmm. her that she decided that that wasn't mm -hmm. what she wanted to yeah. do. And I hope I'm not giving anything away, but it's, she's been barraged by all these messages right. um, that she's a kid. I, right. I couldn't blame her for wanting to take like the easy route, right. route and that's not the kind of person that she is. Yeah. So that's a tough scene though. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And it's interesting because, you know, with that scene, I definitely think about that scene as Malaya, both Malaya and Naila actually sort of for, for once, this is one of the first moments that we see them really sort of on the same team, right? Because, you know, this doctor is very excited about the prospect of operating on Malaya. Mm -hmm. You know, she would be the youngest gastric bypass patient in the city. She would be one of the first of her age ever to undergo this procedure in the United States. And, you know, there's something, Malaya doesn't want to be in the office at all. She doesn't want to be there. Honestly, I think Naila isn't really excited about it, but she's desperate, mm -hmm. right? And so she really is looking for something that she thinks, again, will help and protect her daughter. Um, and yet, you know, the seeing the kind of like hunger in this man's eyes for, you know, the power to change Malaya's body, both of them are on the same page that that's not it, right? Mm -hmm. And that like something is wrong. And I think both of them sort of, you know, bond in a way over a kind of, they, they come to an agreement that this is not going to be the, the thing for Malaya, at least at this moment, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that to me is an important moment for their, their relationship as mother and daughter, because in, in this is a moment where they agree on what is safe for Malaya and what's not, mm -hmm. you know, and that becomes really important. Um, we've talked a lot about the women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the men. Yes. Um, so some, many of the men in this novel don't present all that mm -hmm. well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking in particular of her classmates, Dandre mm -hmm. and Rayshawn mm -hmm. and an older man, mm -hmm. Clarence Edgar. Mm -hmm. But there's one man in this novel who loves Malaya mm -hmm. and who sees her and keeps her secrets. Yeah. And that's her dad. Right. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about what she inherited from, from Percy? Okay, yeah, oh, that's a good way to, that's a really interesting way into it. So absolutely, right, you know, Percy is the first person that tells her that she's beautiful and does so consistently. Mm -hmm. um, and he, yeah, he is somebody who really is encouraging her to live her life fully. He wants her to feel good, essentially, right? And, you know, and that's a, that's a rare kind of, presence in her life, right? And especially in terms of the body. So, right, they're eating Chinese food in secret, right? She spends her Friday nights eating Chinese food and watching TV with her dad, and then her Saturday mornings at Weight Watchers meetings with her mom. And she grows up sort of in that conflict, and in some ways her body becomes a site, you know, a kind of battleground uh, for this conflict between her mother and her father. But of course, as she gets older, she comes to understand where each of them are coming from. So in the same way that Naila is trying to kind of like teach her how to be a woman in the way that she has learned, right? Because she thinks that this will set her up well for success in life. Her father is trying to prevent her from ever experiencing hunger, right? Sort of yeah. physical hunger and emotional hunger. He grew up in the project. He has a kind of visceral memory of physical hunger, and he wants to do anything he can to sort of keep his family from experiencing that. So, you know, that the love that Percy has for Malaya, he expresses in terms of like wanting her to indulge, wanting to her, her to enjoy both food, but also music. They kind mm -hmm. of bond over music. You know, he wants her to enjoy the kind of the pleasures of movement, right? He wants her to kind of play in the streets of Harlem as he did, but that's not possible because they moved to Harlem at the height of the crack epidemic, right? So there's this constant sense of sort of his, he wants Malaya to feel good specifically in her body. And yet the context of the world around them make that difficult. So it ends up being that food is one of the kind of major ways that he communicates his love for her. He's yeah. so really like, tender and mm. kind. And you see that he's a poet. Yeah. He was a poet at one point, still is a poet. Right. And you see that tenderness, I think, come yeah. out in him. It's it's so dear, like yeah. the two of them together oh, in scene. It really is. And and Percy's also that connection to Harlem, which also feels like a character mm -hmm. in the novel right. as well. And you captured it during a period of 
intense change. Mm -hmm. And I love the parallel of a changing Harlem and this changing right. girl's life. Right. Um, take us back to Harlem yes. in the 90s. Like you <laughs> okay. could have set this book in, in a lot of different mm -hmm. time periods. Why Harlem? Why in the 90s? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly it, right? That, you know, we see Harlem, first of all, Harlem has a person has many personalities in some ways right there are not that many neighborhoods in the world that i think sort of call to mind such sort of cultural specificity you know over time right like we can think of sort of many moments in harlem's history where harlem has an identity and it's a changing identity right harlem's you know the identity the culture of harlem have changed several times over history um, and, you know, even sort of the history of the 20th century. So this is a moment where Harlem is getting ready to undergo another major transformation. And as you point out, so is Malaya. Uh, you know, as uh, she is, she's not born in Harlem, right? Her family moves from the upper, from the Lower East Side to Harlem. She also goes to school on the Upper East Side. So parts of her life aren't centered in Harlem, which means that she's aware in some ways of sort of of Harlem as, an, as a kind of important factor in her life. She doesn't take it for granted, right? She thinks about what it means to her. And it is a source of comfort, of joy, specifically music, right? So she, you know, she lives in this brownstone. She can't really play outside on the corner as her parents had envisioned her doing. But what she can do is listen to what's going on outside. And mm -hmm. she's constantly sort of studying the music. It's funny, I was, the other scene I was thinking of reading is the scene where she's on the school bus and she, you know, they're having like sing-alongs on the yeah. school bus and she's singing all the songs that she's hearing playing outside on the radio. And she, of course she's getting the lyrics wrong because that's what you do when you're a kid. So it's like Belle Biv DeVoe and they're, you know, they're messing up the lyrics, but it, it means a lot to her to be able to kind of hear and feel and be part of the neighborhood, even as she feels separated from it for lots of reasons. And as she gets older, one of those reasons becomes the way the neighborhood encounters her body, right? She gets a lot of different kinds of comments on the street about her body. And yet, you know, again, through music and culture of Harlem, that helps her to feel seen, to feel understood, to feel a sense of belonging that become really important as she begins to transform while the neighborhood is transforming. Yeah, it's it was so great to remember all the music that I was mm -hmm. listening to. Like so many people were listening to yeah. in, the in the 90s. Yeah. Like it was a very particular time. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to go back to something because I forgot to ask you a question sure. related to Percy, related to food. Um, so food for lots of people, it's pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. But Malaya grows up with a lot of messages about fatness being mm -hmm. bad, mm -hmm. food being bad, mm -hmm. eating is bad. These right. are all like shameful things. Right. And I feel like it really sort of distorts her relationship to like pleasure yeah. and desire and satisfaction. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that sort of translates outward into other things that aren't related to food. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think, you know, part of what we see happening in that initial scene for me is Malaya really fighting to hold on to her relationship to desire, right? Because she's in a space where, you know, what she's being asked to do is critique her inner yearning, her desire, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, from such a young age, there's a part of her that sort of recognizes that if I give into that, first of all, it may never end because here are these women who are, you know, many, many years older than right. me, still sort of having these inner conflicts about, you know, gravy, how much gravy to put on their grits. And she's like, I don't want to have, I don't want my relationship with my desire, my inner life to be compromised in that way. So she's fighting. And again, she kind of retreats to her imagination. But of course, as she gets older, it becomes harder and harder to sort of, you know, insist on holding on to her desire. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're absolutely right. Part of what we see her sort of have to figure out over the course of the novel is what parts of her desire to hold on to, what parts to let go of, how to make space for, you know, uh, a world and a vision for, a, a, you know, a vision of a life in which she can name her desires, claim them and sort of shape her life, you know, in pursuit of her desires. And that, for her, that ends up being not only enjoying food, right, but also enjoying, you know, physical erotic pleasure mm -hmm. and the pleasure of movement, right? Sort of all the pleasures of the body that she should have access to all of them. And I think it's true that, you know, as you're suggesting, what we see happen with Malaya is by curtailing that initial relationship to the pleasure of food, suddenly she's she's not really able to access 
almost any form of pleasure, right? Or she has to sort of question all of the pleasures of the body and she has to question all of her desire. And it's not until she lets go of the shame that she's able to see, actually, I have, I should have access to, you know, everything good and more. Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so while we're watching all this change going on in Malaya's life, uh, there is, there is a constant that I, I really picked up on, which was art. Mm -hmm. You know, she's always drawing yeah. and yeah. doodling and painting and, yeah. um, and you talked a little bit about um, art in the form of music, but why was it important yeah. to you to center art in, in this child, in this teenager's life? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I mean, she, I see her as someone who sort of comes from a family of artists, as you mentioned. Her dad is a poet. You know, her mom, though not a, a kind of practicing artist, but her mom definitely has a, a kind of eye for the visual. She's always sort of thinking about women's clothing specifically, right? And, you know, sort of, you know, what kind of would look nice in a home. And she's, you know, she's got a kind of, there's something about her emphasis on how things look and appearance that is for her artistic. Of mm -hmm. course, for Malaya, that also becomes like very difficult because her mother's always sort of commenting on how she looks, right? Mm -hmm. But I wanted to kind of trace a little bit of a thread where Malaya comes from a, a, a family of artists and of creative people, and she represents an opportunity in some ways in the family lineage to really have that expressed as art, rather than in some of these other ways that end up, you know, turning into shame or just sort of being dormant or turning into kind of loss and sadness, mm -hmm. you know? So, and it's a way of expressing herself when she doesn't have language. And so that moment in the section that we just talked about where you know, she doesn't yet have the access to language like abundance and profusion and glut. The only word that she has is more. There, there are moments throughout the novel where the narrator sort of supplies language that Malaya doesn't have, right? While she's looking for language, what she does have is this kind of like nonverbal expression in art. And mm -hmm. so she's always kind of trying to figure out the world around her by representing it, you know, in her sketch pad um, and in other spaces. So it is an important form of expression when she doesn't yet have access to language. Yeah. I want to just check how we're doing on time. Oop. Um, we're getting really close and <laughs> okay. I have like a list. We have of to do it again. <laughs> we have to have more um, you know, I'm going to, before we move on to um, the audience's yeah. questions, I, you know, you've been doing a lot of events for the past couple of weeks mm -hmm. uh, since the book came out. And I, I've noticed myself, like when I talk about my own books, I'm usually asked the same questions, yeah. the same things. Are there questions that you wish that Ooh. people would, would ask you or characters that you don't get a chance to talk about enough or themes? That's a really good question. I mean, Ethan Winborn, this is my first time getting to talk about Ethan Winborn. You're kidding. She's fascinating. I, I, thank you. I really liked her, uh, you know, and it could also be because, of course, you know, the novel just came out right on the 12th. So and she appears later in the novel. So it's been really interesting to kind of talk about the novel in ways that don't necessarily, you know, sort of spoil anything or give anything away. So I do find most of the conversations have centered on either the big themes or the early scenes, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, she's a character who I really enjoy. Um, and again, I'm glad that you asked about why she's important because it does sort of bring up those themes of, you know, sort of, again, medical fat phobia, medical racism, which is another important theme that I'm glad to be talking about, you know, that hasn't come up very much. Um, what else? Well, I, something, this is not, this doesn't quite answer your question, but the way you phrased the question about Percy, which I really appreciate, I hadn't actually thought about sort of the the cast of male characters in the novel, but as soon as you mentioned it, I thought, what another male character that Malaya really connects with is the late great notorious B.I.G. Yes, right. Yes. And so it's interesting to think about like Biggie and Percy as sort of, you know, connected in the landscape of Malaya's imagination. Um, both of them, in some ways, she connects to because of their vulnerability and their complexity and their kind of artistic expression, yeah. you know? So that's something that you helped me kind of just tease out as we've been talking. So, but yeah, I mean, no, I, I can't think of anything. I mean, I do hope that folks, you know, I hope that folks sort of read the novel with all of these ideas in mind and thinking about, as you mentioned, Harlem as a character, I think of hip hop as a character mm -hmm. also, um, both, you know, because in both cases, both of them, Malai has a kind of intimate relationship to that help change her mind about these larger issues of race, gender, class, and sexuality. And ultimately, I think the, those are the comments that the novel wants to make, right? That like, we can rethink our relationships to these, you know, structures of power, essentially, in ways that free us to really 
offer ourselves access to all the pleasure, all the power, all the joy in the world. Excellent. Um, Sophia's walking this way. Okay. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, I want to invite anyone from our audience, both virtual and in person, to ask any questions at this point now. Um, whatever your heart desires, please come on down to the mic, either the mic that I'm standing at or the mic opposite to me on the other side of the auditorium. Again, whichever one calls to you most strongly. Oh, good. This is great. <laughs> I just want to ask a question as a follow-up about as she ages into teenage years, and I think you mentioned the male characters, but I do think one of the things about the novel is the ways it shows various intimate relationships shifting how we think about our bodies. And so is it Shanice, mm -hmm. the friendship between Shanice and Malaya? Yeah. Um, in terms of, do you see that as um, figuring into shifting the kind of dynamic around queerness and how mm -hmm. we see that um, in Black women's fiction in adolescence mm -hmm. as well. So. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that question. Yes, um, and it's interesting because, you know, I see, so Shanice is a character who, she mentions Shanice, in fact, in fact, the first mention we get of Shanice, right, is that they eat, you know, these dulce de coco, these like coconut, you know, Dominican coconut candies together in secret, right? So they share a secret sort of forbidden pleasure of the body as children. And as they grow older, that transforms into a kind of erotic desire and an erotic relationship, a sexual relationship between the two of them. And I was thinking about this, you know, in another conversation I had about the novel, you know, from one perspective that might be framed as a kind of like sexual experimentation, right? But I think in Malaya's case, it actually connects with what we were just talking about, about desire, you know, sort of knowing early on what she wants, right? But sort of not being able to, to claim it or experience it. And so as she gets older, she becomes more and more free, right? And she sort of frees herself to really sort of acknowledge what she wants. And Shanice does the same thing. And in fact, Shanice is kind of, you know, Shanice is the kind of character who, in fact, back in the day, they would call fast, right? And like her you know, mom air certainly has that to say about Shanice. But truly she's, you know, she's quicker to arrive at this kind of like freedom. Um, and Malaya admires that, right? And like kind of really loves that. So I see that absolutely as a young love relationship, even as it is also a friendship. And in fact, it's a friendship at its core, but it is an erotic friendship and it's a, it's a love relationship for sure. So yeah, thank you. Yes, yes, BBT. Yeah. 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 Unrelated, but your earrings are fantastic. Um, so, yes, many personal experiences. There are a lot of ways in which Malaya's experience sort of connects with my own growing up in Harlem. You know, uh, you know, going to school on the Upper East Side, loving hip hop, loving Biggie specifically, and certainly a, a lot of Malaya's sort of experiences with her body are experiences that I had. There are also really kind of crucial ways in which Malaya is very different. Her personality is very different from mine. Um, and she, I think, sort of reaches that moment of, you know, really kind of like refusing to give in to the narratives of shame around her body. She gets there a lot faster than I did. You know, she's, again, a teenager as we start to see her actually kind of like shutting those narratives down, right? And so I learned a lot from writing this character. But in terms of, you know, there were several kind of, um, yes, yeah, sort of scenes that I drew from my own experience and just kind of facts of Malaya's life that I drew from my own experience, you know, What's also interesting is that the characters that surround Malaya, you know, so especially like Mom Air, you know, both Percy and Naila, but, you know, the, her, her crew of friends, she has a whole kind of crew of friends at her school and they call themselves La Famille and all of those, you know, in some ways pull from my experience, but they, it became a really sort of robust world that, again, I had to kind of discover, you know what I mean, as a writer. And I enjoyed that process of 
you know, pulling back from my own experience and really learning from and being surprised by these characters. But to your the, the point about music, you know, I, I think this is true for me. And this is true for a lot of our literatures, right? That like music becomes, again, a character in a way. Um, and it becomes a, a, me- a mechanism for surviving, right? For kind of like, especially in the face of forces like gentrification, right? That like we continue to create and recreate. And so it was important for me to center that as part of the novel, not only because I have experienced that, but because it's an, it's an important theme in African-American and African diaspora literatures. And I definitely, you know, see this as being an extension of that. This is what that looks like at the end of the 20th century. Thank you for that. We have an online question. So while reading this, I had to pause because some things were so real. The focus on what's wrong versus what's right. Was writing this book therapeutic for you? That's a good question. Um, was it therapeutic? You know, my inclination is to say no, not there. I mean, it was hard, you know? So, I mean, I guess therapy is hard too. So that doesn't mean that it wasn't therapeutic, I guess. But no, I, I don't think it was therapeutic. Um, like the writing process wasn't therapeutic, but it felt necessary, you know? And because I really set out to write this book because it was a, it was a book that I needed to read, right? And of course, you know, we all know the famous Toni Morrison quote, right? Where she says, there's a book that you need to read that hasn't been written, you must write it. This was absolutely that book for me. And so it did fulfill a need, but it was a need to see, again, a big black queer girl represented in literature in a way that really um, sort of centered her complex inner life, her mind, right? That like, even as so much of the book is about other people's perceptions of her body, as a reader, we are in Malaya's inner life, right? We're sort of, we see her fantasy life, we see her pain, we see her joy, we see, again, her kind of, her imagination. It was important to me to write that book. I didn't find it, um, you know, as I was searching when I was coming of age myself. So from that standpoint, I would say it was necessary and it was healing, but I wouldn't say it was therapeutic because it was, you know, it was a challenge and it was you know, it was a creative challenge, you know what I mean? Not just like an emotional challenge, you know, trying to figure out like structure and, and you know, figure out sort of how I want to tell this story. That part, you know, was, was an intellectual um, exercise that I spent a lot of time on and worked hard on. Yeah. Thank you. We have one comment from online about grandma. Okay, I love it. Grandma didn't mean any harm, but she caused harm. Mm -hmm. It's like, who stood up for this young lady? I'm so thankful she had her dad. Mm. Thank you for that. And I do think, I I agree, right? I love that phrase. She didn't mean any harm, but she caused harm. I think, you know, almost everyone in Malaya's family really does care for her, right? And they are, they are doing their best. And part of Malaya's task is to understand them so that she can have compassion for herself you know, the compassion that they don't have for themselves. Hi. I don't think so. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. I don't know if you can hear Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I want to compliment you. Thank you. On your success as a writer, um, as a professor, and the work that you do. Thank you. My favorite area. Yeah. Well, any of anything yeah. is what you do. Anyhow, um, not having read the book, mm-hmm. it, it's hard to know what was really going on except for your introduction. Um, it would be nice, I think, that when you discuss the book, because this is like an interview. I listen to them on NPR all mm-hmm. the time. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, if you could kind of read the themes that you're addressing into your discussion of your work Hmm. because it's not like being in a class where we have actually read parts of it and now you're um, expounding on the different areas. But anyway, um, I wondered how when you set out to write a book like this that you does it like a bell go off hmm. and you say, today I'm going to start outlining 
and this is the book that I want to write, hmm. and all the reasons why. Oh, is it some kind of a lengthy process where you did any kind of research and, you know, going back to places and things and people? Mm -hmm. Just the development of your writing that Sure. It was absolutely a very lengthy process with lots of research and, you know, sort of lots of work. And at the same time, you know, as I said, I did have, there was a kind of, you know, a, a moment of a bell going off. It was when I was very young. And again, when I, when I realized that, you know, I was, I discovered Toni Morrison, I discovered Antezaki Change, I discovered Jamaica Kincaid. A little bit later, I discovered Audre Lorde. And I connected so much with their stories. And yet there was this one aspect of their stories that was so key to my personal experience and the experiences of so many other big Black girls that I knew that I just didn't see represented in the way that you know, that I saw so many other aspects of our experiences represented. And so from that standpoint, Yes, there was a kind of clear moment where I realized I want to write this book. That was many, many years ago, right? And so like almost every, you know, professional choice certainly that I've made between then and now has been in the service of of writing this book. And so this book has undergone many, 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 many revisions and, you know, plenty of sort of moments of kind of rethinking what the structure should be, as I said, and, you know, how I should tell this story, what's the best way to tell this story. Um, it was actually, the very first draft of this was my master's thesis before I even began a PhD. So it was like many, many years ago. And then I just kept kind of coming back to it over the course of many years between semesters while I was doing my PhD, between jobs as I was kind of moving around, continuing to kind of come back because it was important enough to me to, you know, to, to get this story out and to get it right, you know what I mean? To really tell it in the way that I felt was most effective um, and would be most resonant at the right time. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that's the part that I really like to get from an author mm -hmm. and, um, you know, how right. Mm. Black women and Absolutely. Age and, you know, one problem, one issue or another, I shouldn't say problem. Mm. I was just skinny. Okay, you know? right. Okay, my parents, if they could see me now. Mm. <laughs> so I didn't, but there are, you know, all the other things, and females, mm -hmm. females, and the society, and the culture, and it just never ends. It's so true. But thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Hi. So many authors have a lot of behind, excuse me, behind the scenes things that they have mm. for their book. I'd love to know what type of behind the scenes things that you had that might not have made it to the book. Oh, that's Ooh, a good that's question. A great question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. So um, since this is a book that I've been working on for so many years, I definitely, you know, I've been, I mentioned the structural revisions that I did a few times. For a long time, I was working with a shifting third person narrator. So at, at this point, you know, the, the, in the novel, we stay pretty much in a third person, you know, she, her narrator that's closely related to Malaya's perspective. But there were previous versions where we got some of Percy's perspective, some of the mother's perspective, some of Shanice's perspective. And, you know, so I, I ended up spending a lot of time in each of those characters' perspectives for several chapters. And, you know, some of those are kind of out in the world. I published excerpts here and there. So they're a little, you know, I don't know. I feel like this, the sci-fi people call them Easter eggs. Like they're, you know, kind of like little little things. If you're interested, you can probably find and think of, you know, certain scenes you might see parts of them or aspects of them from other characters' perspectives. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. There's also a playlist. There's a big girl playlist that my publisher encouraged me to put together. Yeah, and so, you know, it's something I haven't posted it yet. It's on Spotify though, so you can find it. And it definitely kind of goes into, you know, her relationship with hip hop. There's a lot of Biggie, a lot of Kim, a lot of the BBD is on there, the Belle Biv DeVoe is on there, but also some of the music that she grows up hearing in her, in the home. So the music that her mother and father, so there's a lot of Earth, Wind and Fire on there. There's a lot of Stevie. So that's another, you know, kind of related, you know, piece of work that's out there in the world. That's a great question. Yeah. Yes. Okay, sounds good. 
Hi. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Wow. That's what's up. Okay. America. To a certain woman. Mm -hmm. Community. On it, touchy, touchy stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So, and I think in some ways, you know, I'm, I have a, I think I have one answer to both of these, right? I think they're, they're closely related. Part of what I'm hearing in the question is sort of, how do we, you know, sort of express our love and our care, and maybe even our concern, right, for the people who we care about, specifically maybe Black girls. Um, and I think before we get to the point of expressing our love and our care and our concern, I think it's important to listen, right? Listening to, from any age, listening to Black girls is something that I think is not necessarily, you know, it, it may not be sort of second nature, but really sort of listening to Black girls, listening to what they say, listening to what they don't say, especially if they don't have a language, if they're too young to really express what they need, but really trying to kind of listen to what they want, what they need, how they feel, right? As a kind of first step, you know, I think often, and I'm not a parent, so full disclosure, right? This is not an experience I've had, but remembering childhood and having spent a lot of time reading and researching and thinking about childhood, you know, even children often have a clear sense of what they, what they need before they're able to verbally express it. And so I think sort of paying attention to the child and to their inner life and to their, you know, to what's going on with them, maybe before we begin to express our concern, right? Um, and then I, you know, I do think, especially if we're talking about grown people, I think it's important to kind of ask ourselves whether we need to express our concern, right? I mean, most of us are aware enough about what's going on with our bodies that, you know, we don't necessarily need somebody else to tell us. Um, I, that's, I think it's a case by case situation, but even there too, I think, you know, what I, I hope that folks kind of think about what it looks like to deprioritize a sense of, you know, an external standard, what what I think is healthy for you, what I think is good for you, what I think you, looks good on you or, you know, and really kind of like let people make their choices for themselves and for their own body. To me, that's the vision of freedom that I would like to see Black women have. Yeah, thank you for asking. Ooh. Hi. Thank you, Becca, and thank you, Jen, for this evening's conversation. I want to thank the Hearing and Speech Agency for providing accessibility for tonight's program. And I want to thank our wonderful audience, both in person and at home, joining us on this very toasty <laughs> July evening. Yes. Um, if you haven't already, please purchase your copy from the Ivy Bookshop, link posted online and right outside our wonderful auditorium. And with that, Everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. 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 Thank you.